thanks a lot. Uh, right. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to an exciting day uh, uh, of, of this uh, two-day Sci-Fi Symposium uh, hosted by uh, RBC CPS. Uh, and we have a special session right now, which is sort of more uh, looking at some of uh, uh, the research going on uh, at, uh, within the Institute itself. Uh, in, in the area of uh, cyber physical system, autonomous systems, and so on. And we have a sort of very strong slate of uh, uh, faculty, up and coming uh, <laughs> faculty with, with, with some really promising research and sort of the young Turks uh, that, that we have to showcase in the next hour or so. Uh, and uh, first up, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Jishnu Keshwan, uh, who is going to be talking on bio inspired sensory motor control. Uh, Jishnu is an assistant professor at mechanical engineering at IASC. His research lies broadly in the area of dynamic systems theory, nonlinear dynamics, and control and autonomous vision. And uh, he has a uh, PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland. So, Jishnu, uh, please take it over. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Professor Simon. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, so, my topic today, uh, or so rather, my talk today, will be centered on the topic of bio inspired sensory motor control uh, with particular relevance to uh, urban, reactive urban navigation applications. And so, to motivate this problem a little bit, uh, shown here on the left is uh, a video of uh, Amazon's recent, uh, recently developed uh, delivery platform. This is the Amazon Air. And so if you actually look at the video, uh, I'll play this video again. If you look at the video here, what it does is it's basically currently deployed in a very controlled setting, right? So it's basically flying in a mainly obstacle-free arena. So to actually accomplish package delivery. So as opposed to, you know, uh, solving this uh, or rather uh, uh, deploying a system that looks like this, what really needs to happen if you wish to deploy a system like this in a typical urban environment is that as opposed to, you know, accomplishing just point of one navigation, which is what this platform does at the moment, you need to be able to, you know, deploy a system that can actually adapt to complex and varied structure, which is what an urban environment is. And so you also need to be able to, and this is especially true of aerial vehicles, they need to be able to uh, overcome disturbances that are typically of the order of uh, platform capabilities. So all of this actually makes it really challenging to synthesize closed loop systems that, uh, with rigorous performance guarantees. And so our objective has been, as opposed to accomplishing just point-to-point -point or waypoint navigation, we wish to accomplish waypoint navigation while uh, 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 coupling that with a reactive navigation loop, which is able to overcome the problem of, you know, um, uh, static and mobile clutter. And so the real, the key question that has motivated this problem for me at least is the uh, design of control systems, closed loop systems, where we generate useful motion cues and make rapid control decisions while achieving uh, uh, rigorous performance guarantees in, in such navigationally challenging environments. And so that's been overarching theme of a lot of my work over the recent past. And so if you look at, if you conduct a literature survey of uh, the studies in the recent past in this area, uh, if you look at the state of the art in terms of sensing and processing paradigms that have been deployed for these kinds of applications, you see that in contrast with the GPS, which gives us a position fix and I view, which gives us a fix of not just the attitude, but the angular uh, and linear velocities as well. And the laser range finder, which slightly differently gives us proximity information or encodes information of the surrounding scene structure. We have a camera that actually gives us information from a combination of these sensors, right? So for instance, it gives us information of the linear and angular velocities of camera, as well as information encoding surrounding scene structure. And so in a way, camera actually does the job of two or more sensory modalities. And so a camera is a really nice sensor to work with. And the other uh, attractive uh, uh, advantage offered by a camera is the bandwidth it can operate at, right? For instance, in comparison with some of the other sensors, which actually have a fairly low bandwidth, sensing bandwidth, we have a camera that can actually be deployed at, at, at bandwidths needed to perceive and react uh, rapidly in the presence of static and mobile critter. And so that is what a very attractive, uh, that makes it a very attractive sensing modality for applications like these. And so on the other hand, if you look at the uh, control architectures that are deployed for applications like these, you see typically see a hierarchical control architecture, one where you actually have a mission planner that plans waypoint or path planner that um, plans waypoints uh, for uh, the vehicle to follow, uh, which typically happens at uh, time scales of about one to 10 seconds or so. And then at the, at the lower level, we actually have a slightly faster loop, which is the reactive navigation, uh, uh, where uh, the need for reactive navigation is felt. And so the, this is where uh, the, the need for uh, synthesizing closed loop with bandwidth uh, for uh, being able to, uh, that can actually perceive and react to clutter is really felt. And so the, these uh, uh, closed loops actually are uh, uh, operate at a bandwidth of about uh, 
one tenth of a second or so, even up between a, a one tenth to a hundred one hundredth of a second or so. And then at, at the, at the lowest loop is obviously the uh, the loop that actually accomplishes uh, flight stabilization. And so this actually has to be the fastest. And so it actually typically happens at about um, hundreds of seconds or so. And so this is a typical hierarchical control architecture that is typically deployed for applications like these. And so if you actually look at the block diagram and see what the stumbling block is in, in help that could actually um, uh, be the hindrance for improving the closed loop bandwidth, you actually see that it's a map extraction uh, block here, which actually encodes three different sub modules, uh, which, uh, which actually slows down the bandwidth of the closed loop. And so, uh, main motivating factor for a lot of my research has been the ability to synthesize a reactive navigation strategy without the need for building a map. And that's purely based on instantaneous input output data. And so to do that, uh, uh, we've looked at uh, bio-inspiration, the idea of bio-inspiration, where we actually seek inspiration from nature. And the reason we do that is across different insect species, uh, for instance, locust, where a mechanosensory array is deployed uh, is actually used, is leveraged for accomplishing both uh, flight control and gust stabilization. You have the fruit flies uh, compound eye, which actually is used for reactive navigation. Uh, and we have, interestingly, we have the Mexican blind cavefish, uh, which actually deploys what's known as electrolocation for accomplishing wall following and proximity detection. And finally, we have the arachne, which actually deploys this distributed uh, tactile uh, sensing array for accomplishing prey localization. So all of these different species actually uh, deploy the same sensory motor convergence strategy. And so their nervous systems, are, all of them uh, form useful reductions of high dimensional sensory data. And they do that by forming simple representations of surrounding environments and rich sensory input streams. And so they are extremely efficient uh, at uh, coming up with computation constraint paradigms that satisfy size, weight, power, and bandwidth requirements. And so. The other reason why by inspiration plays um, is very attractive is that insects actually are, as we all notice, or are, as we all know, are extremely good at operating across a wide range of conditions. And so the, the way they do that is by leveraging fast computationally simple perceptual capabilities that actually lead to robust flight uh, feedback control architectures, and which actually is what helps them realize robust flight uh, behaviors. And so that is the main reason why by inspiration actually is so attractive. And so if you actually delve into the insect eye architecture a little bit, we actually see that the insect eye, as opposed to a human eye, is a compound eye in that it encodes individual, numerous individual sensory elements known as umatidia. They have about 60 units per compound eye that encompass the whole visual field. And so for a typical insect that deployed, say, in a typical wooded environment, that either one that's uh, translating as shown in this image on the left, or that's rotating as shown in this image on the right, uh, they, these eyes actually capture what are known as incident or incident, they capture patterns of incidence known as optic flow, which actually are spread over the whole visual field as shown here. And so these patterns of optic flow, which are spread over the whole visual field, actually encode information, uh, not just of the relative motion of the observer, in this case, the insect relative to its environment, but also encodes information of surrounding scene structure. And so these patterns of luminance are then parsed, or, the, or these patterns of optic flow are then parsed in a suitable manner. Uh, to generate this handful of flight motor commands. So you have this uh, pat, uh, principle of sensory motor convergence that actually is uh, followed to generate these flight motor commands that rely, that lead to these robust flight behaviors. And so the key to do that is to mathematically, to be able to replicate that behavior is to mathematically model uh, these patterns of optic flow and then parse them in a manner that insects do. And so to that end, we have optic flow, which actually gives us a speed over depth quantity. And so it basically encodes relative speed, not just of the observer relative to its environment, but also surrounding scene structure, and hence gives us relative proximity information. And so if you look at the mathematical expression for optic flow, it encodes contribution uh, omega uh, that comes from the observer's rotation, but also a con contribution from the observer's translational motion that's coupled by this nearness parameter mu, which actually is the inverse of the radial distance to fiducial markers or uh, obstacles in the surrounding environment. So that's the key. Uh, uh, so that's the key uh, sensory input here, the patterns of optic flow spread across the whole visual field, which can then be passed in a suitable manner to generate these uh, numerous flight behaviors. And so the way the insects actually parse these uh, patterns of optic flow is through a process known as wide field integration, where they rely on a set of basis functions. Uh, that actually span the whole visual field uh, to parse these patterns of optic flow that re realize these optic flow outputs why that are purely a function of the vehicle's instantaneous states and so then these patterns of also these patterns of optic flow outputs which are just a purely a function of vehicle states can then be embedded within a, a typical traditional feedback control loop uh, and through uh, a straightforward lq uh, or a 
a more complicated H infinity synthesis architecture, one could actually then realize either simple wall following or more complicated navigation in urban like environments. And so to illustrate this example shown here is uh, the flight of a fruit fly in a typical straight line corridor like environment where the objective is for the fruit fly to actually follow the center line of the corridor. So for any small perturbations above the center line, the optic flow pattern as, and since we are focusing on uh, navigation in a plane, the optic flow pattern is going to be uh, uh, a, peri uh, a, pe a periodic function of the visual angle gamma, visual uh, viewing angle gamma. So it's going to be periodic over two pi. And so uh, a typical uh, basis uh, function set that could be used to decompose these patterns of optic flow would then naturally be uh, the harmonics of the Fourier series. And so we have the DC component and the first two components, cosine components of the harmonic series, which we actually see uh, as shown here, which could then be used to parse these patterns of optic flow. And then we actually see that they actually give rise to these linear combinations of these states that are really useful for accomplishing center line uh, uh, and wall following behaviors. And so these patterns of optic flow can then be embedded again in a feedback loop to realize you know, a simple straightforward center line following strategy. And so a similar strategy can then be extended to you know, accomplishing uh, reactive navigation in urban like environments. And so you can actually couple that with a more sophisticated, uh, robust controller synthesis frameworks uh, like the one shown here, for instance, it can be used to achieve numerous performance objectives. Like for, for those of you who are familiar with what this diagram here is, uh, the singular value diagram shown here is, uh, it's, it, 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 the diagram emphasizes the fact that we can actually synthesize robust controller frameworks that meet uh, performance objectives across the whole frequency spectrum. For instance, you have performance objectives at the lower end of the frequency spectrum, which would be gust mitigation and reference tracking, and you would have noise attenuation at the higher end of the frequency spectrum. And so combination of that with uh, the emphasis on coming up with a robust stability and performance objective actually leads to behaviors that actually look like these. So shown here is a simulation of the actual vehicle, which relies purely on op optic flow to actually uh, you know, find its way through a typical urban environment. So this is a single uh, sample of its trajectory as it tries through this environment. Again, uh, it needs to be emphasized that this is purely reactive. There's no element of planning involved. But this, as simple as the strategy is actually works really well when, even, uh, when it's deployed even in a real world setting. So for instance, when it's flying through uh, not just a straight line corridor, but it's flying along uh, a corridor of different widths and different shapes, it actually seems to do fairly well uh, as long uh, in uh, keeping to the center line. And so again, entirely, all of this is entirely based on um, optic flow feedback. So while, uh, so this strategy actually works really well in being able to perceive and react to large obstacles, uh, you need a complementary strategy uh, that actually can overcome the problem of small obstacle detection and avoidance. And so to do that, we actually, again, go back uh, to the idea of planar optic flow, which is a periodic signal over the spatial uh, window uh, gamma. And so these patterns of optic flow in the presence of wide field obstacles induce low frequency spatial patterns. And in the presence of small field obstacles induce high frequency spatial patterns in optic flow. And so the idea then is to actually be able to uh, detect uh, low frequency perturbations arising from wide field obstacles and remove that from the incident pattern to sharpen small field detection. So that's the key idea behind uh, small field detection and avoidance applications. And so we actually have two applications, uh, two approaches here, the first of which is the Fourier residual, where we follow the same, this, the previous strategy of, of uh, extracting wide field component of optic flow and simply subtracting that from the incident pattern. And then this pattern of this small field component then actually encodes information that's useful for accomplishing reactive navigation in uh, a typical uh, obstacle laden environment, which is range and bearing to the nearest obstacle. And so one could actually extract these particular motion cues from the small field signal and combine that with a typical steering controller law, like the one used here to be able to uh, uh, realize very robust obstacle avoidance behaviors. So in contrast with this very simple strategy, we also, we also looked at a slightly more complex bio-inspired strategy for small field detection and avoidance. So where we actually um, use uh, a second set of elementary motion detectors Detectors that are basically used to compute optic flow. And so we have flow of optic flow. And so this approach is known as flow of flow, which again has been mathematically shown to uh, give us the same kind of information that we have with the previous strategy. So we still extract the small field component of optic flow, which could then be used to uh, uh, get a fix of the range and bearing to the nearest obstacle, which could then again be uh, coupled with the same control law as before to be able to accomplish results that look like these. 
So we've been able to show results uh, at a close loop bandwidth of about 60 Hertz or so. In fact, there is promise of actually even going faster. Uh, the idea is to improve the bandwidth to about 120 Hertz or so. And at, we have been able to show in some experiments that we can actually reach 120 Hertz or so. And so if you can see, look at the video here, we see that the vehicle is actually, uh, at each instant, the vehicle, uh, the yellow marker there actually uh, points to the nearest obstacle. And that gives us both the range and the bearing. And that is what is used to evade that particular obstacle in the local environment. And so this is a very safe, inherently safe data-driven strategy uh, where the vehicle is actually confined to free space. And so it actually, uh, leverages an efficient perception actuation loop uh, that actually works well amidst not just static clutter, but also offers a promise of working well uh, amidst uh, mobile clutter. Uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll quickly just show a couple more videos and just wrap up my uh, presentation here. Thank so uh, we extended this to the case of a ground vehicle as well, where we've shown reactive, uh, we have combined reactive navigation strategy uh, where we both the strategies of small field and large field obstacle avoidance with a waypoint uh, tracking strategy as well. And so we've shown both reactive and waypoint navigation in this particular experiment here. So uh, since we may not have time, so I'll actually skip quickly to the next last slide and then be done with it wrap it up. So shown here, differently from the previous video, shown here is the example of a Mexican blind cavefish. Uh, shown here is in this video is an example of a Mexican blind cavefish, which actually is demonstrating wall falling behaviors. And in contrast with vision, it actually is shown to deploy electrolocation. So it actually deploys what's known as a dipole sensory ring, which actually is used to generate a nominal electrostatic potential field. And any perturbation in this electrostatic potential field, which arises from the presence of surrounding obstacles in the local environment, could then be detected and could then be fed back within a typical control loop to demonstrate wall following and obstacle avoidance behaviors as shown in this experiment here. So it's again just goes to show that this principle of sensory motor convergence and by inspired sensory motor control works across a range of different uh, platforms uh, and across a range of uh, uh, that is aerial ground and underwater and across the different domains again aerial ground and underwater and across a range of different sensory modalities uh, vision and electrolocation in this case so it's a very versatile strategy and this is probably the reason why a lot of insect species actually leverage this strategy to actually you know accomplish robust flight behaviors or navigational behaviors and so to wrap it up uh, the idea behind sensory motor convergence looking at sensory motor convergence is to actually uh, leverage the principles of sensory motor convergence and combine that with tools from traditional control architecture and replicate, hopefully replicate the performance of natural systems. And so the main question as applied to navigational problems is to uh, uh, synthesize control systems that, fail, that help us make rapid control decisions in the face of uncertainty and very potentially very noisy data. And so we've been able to leverage some of these points by strategies for demonstrating both large field and small field obstacle avoidance, even as uh, uh, together with waypoint navigation to our world. So with that, I'll probably wrap this up and thanks uh, for listening to me. Thanks, Professor Simon. I think I'm done. Thanks a lot, Jishnu. Really appreciate it. Really fascinating work. It's really nice to see things actually translated into working prototype in the video. Sure. Exceptional. And I'm sure uh, many others can look up your website and find more information. Certainly. Uh, so next up, I'm going to invite Pawan uh, Telapagada to uh, share his uh, slides. And meanwhile, if there's any quick question for uh, Jishnu, he can take it while Pawan is setting up. Okay. Uh, if not, uh, uh, please hold your questions and maybe take it offline with Jishnu. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Pawan uh, to as uh, the next speaker in this uh, uh, RBCPS session. So Pawan is an assistant professor at uh, the uh, Electrical Engineering Department as well as the uh, Bosch Center, and he's also from University of Maryland. He got his uh, PhD from over there. Uh, and his research interests include network control systems, distributed systems and control, and multi-agent systems. And he's won many laurels in this context, including uh, the uh, outstanding paper award at transactions on control uh, of networks. And uh, Pawan's going to be talking about, as it says, population dynamics on networks. Pawan, all yours. Okay, uh, thanks Yogesh uh, for the introduction and thanks uh, for the invitation too. Uh, so I hope you can see my uh, slides and you can hear yes. me clearly. Okay, great. So uh, as Yogesh said, I'll be talking on uh, population dynamics on networks today. And uh, compared to uh, most of the talks in the symposium, uh, the theme of this uh, talk and uh, the motivations are uh, somewhat different. Uh, and uh, basically the, uh, the, 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 at a very high level, the main idea of, uh, uh, or main motivation for this work is that in a lot of large scale systems, uh, we have populations of agents in the loop. 
Okay, so what do I mean by that? So, um, and, and that these agents, for example, they could be robots or they could be some other agents too. Uh, so for example, we can uh, think about large swarms with a very large uh, collection of robots. And certainly what we're gonna talk about today in this uh, uh, presentation, it is going to be applicable uh, for such settings too. Right? So let's say if we want to control a large form of robots uh, without directly controlling each individual robot, but just by giving some aggregate signals. So that is certainly possible. Uh, but I also want to talk about uh, other uh, situations or other systems, large scale systems, where there are uh, uh, large populations involved. And uh, uh, these populations could be uh, of uh, humans actually in some sense or uh, other uh, agents too. So uh, as an example, let's think about, uh, let's say uh, navigation using Google Maps, we all do that, it's very useful, but as uh, thousands and thousands of people do it in a city, it has the potential to change the traffic patterns. Right? And similarly, uh, we can also think about how, uh, let's say uh, more choices of population uh, evolve over time, right? As there are disruptions uh, in either technology or maybe uh, because there is new infrastructure and so on, right? And uh, uh, we can also think about uh, other uh, populations, like let's say populations of insects and so on. Uh, and we can think about migration of uh, these entities, right? So if you, uh, if you remember, so last year there was a, a big locust swarm that migrated all the way from Africa to India and uh, this form was destroying crops in, uh, in its park, essentially. So uh, certainly studying how these uh, insect forms migrate uh, from one place to another and all such things, uh, they are useful uh, for planning and so on. Uh, similarly, I mean, we may be interested in things like migration of people uh, across countries or within a country and, uh, uh, or in a more abstract sense, let's say uh, towards certain professions and so on, okay. And uh, so of course, these kind of problems have been studied under uh, you know, various different disciplines uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, one thing is uh, the dynamical systems perspective uh, has been somewhat limited. You know, so studies using dynamical systems perspective is somewhat limited. And uh, so such a perspective is certainly useful particularly when we are thinking about behavior of large populations under disruptions. Right? So certainly we have seen uh, many different kinds of disruptions in the last few years, uh, let's say in the transportation world, either because uh, some new service like Uber came into being, or uh, especially in India, we have had many uh, metro services beginning in many different cities. And in the telecom sector, we know uh, what Geo has done. Uh, and in the past one year, of course, uh, we know again, uh, many things uh, that have happened uh, due to COVID-19 uh, and so on. Okay, so one is the migrant labor issue itself and the other is now uh, many of us are working from home, at least those of us who have jobs and so on, right? And uh, some of this may continue, right? So working from home uh, may continue in many sectors for a long time. Right, so essentially, so what we see is in many of these problems, so we of course have dynamics, right? So, and okay, as I said, uh, so uh, some people have been studying these kinds of things for a long time, uh, but more importantly here, we also have some either spatial constraints in uh, what these agents can, uh, why is their choices to, or uh, even in an abstract setting, there can be some constraints. So that we model by essentially a network, so uh, what we have is essentially a network of choices where the nodes represent choices, uh, the edges represents uh, some constraints uh, between uh, some constraints on how these agents can revise their choices and so on. Okay, we consider a population of a continuum of agents and then uh, nodes represent the choices made by agents at any given time. And uh, essentially uh, uh, the dynamics comes about by uh, this process of agents seeking to maximize their payoff function by moving on the network. Okay, so uh, formally we denote uh, by this xi as the fraction of population that is there in node i at any given time t. Okay, and then uh, this pi is the cumulative payoff function of node i. So just as an example, if we think about the fleet uh, redistribution problem that we were just talking about a little while back, 
So there, uh, the nodes can represent uh, the service locations of regions in the city. Uh, XI is a fraction of the fleet that is there in the node I. And uh, PI is the measure of profitability or demand of node I. Okay. So, uh, in fact, a minor contribution of our work is uh, so-called stratified payoffs. So, we assume that agents in a given node uh, don't all receive the same average payoff, uh, or rather, they don't receive the same payoff. Uh, rather, uh, so what we say is, if uh, xi is the fraction in node i, then uh, any subinterval a b that is of uh, subinterval of zero to xi that we call as a strata. And that strata receives uh, essentially this PIB minus PIA divided by B minus A. And that is nothing but the area under the curve of um, the derivative of this uh, average payoff or this payoff function PI. Uh, and uh, this, uh, that derivative we call as payoff density uh, function and that is denoted by UI. Okay, so uh, for the analysis to be tractable and so on, so we assume that these PIs are uh, twice continuously differentiable and uh, strictly concave. So uh, in terms of interpretation, so this translates to uh, a setting uh, that is related to where the returns are. Uh, so or rather we have diminishing returns. Right? So payoff functions capture something to do with diminishing returns. So the cumulative payoff of uh, agents in node i is this pi of xi minus pi zero, and then associate utility is just the sum of all the uh, uh, cumulative payoffs of agents in, uh, in all the nodes. Uh, the class of dynamics that we consider uh, is something that we call as flow balance dynamics, and it is uh, easily expressed uh, in this uh, very simple form, actually. Uh, so we look at any two neighboring nodes in the graph, and then uh, we associate outflows uh, from one node to the other that we denote by this delta ij. Okay, and then uh, the rate of change of uh, the fraction in node i is simply uh, the overall inflow to node i at that time minus the overall outflow from that node i. Okay, concisely we can just uh, express it in the form of this uh, vector uh, equation. So x dot uh, is equal to j times delta x, and j is the incidence matrix here, and delta, this capital delta x, uh, aggregates together all these small delta i. And so that is the dynamics. Okay, so now uh, we get different dynamics uh, if we choose different delta uh, of x functions. Okay, and we will consider uh, three such dynamics now. Uh, but no matter what that delta of x is, uh, we can immediately say we can make the simple observation that uh, the simplex, right, uh, that is this uh, set, uh, set of all non negative vectors such that one transpose b is equal to one. So that simplex is positively invariant under this dynamics, no matter what this delta of x is. Okay. So it's it's a simple observation, but it's it's useful. Okay, so uh, we consider three dynamics, uh, each with the varying degrees of coordination among the agents. The first one is for selfish agents, okay, and uh, this we call as stratified Smith dynamics. Uh, we take the standard Smith dynamics in the literature and then we adapt it to our uh, setting where we have stratified payoff functions. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, because I mean it's it's a minor extension of some existing dynamics, so I won't really go into much details about that. So uh, rather, I'll talk about the remaining two dynamics. The first of which is uh, the so-called nodal best response dynamics. So in here, what is happening is uh, at each node i, so at each time instant, uh, the agents in node i they solve an optimization problem, and this optimization problem. Uh, so I'll just interpret what this problem is. So what it says is it looks at all the uh, population fraction in that node i, and it says what is the optimal redistribution of that uh, uh, population fraction among its, the node i and its neighbors. Okay, and uh, okay, so we get the solution, and that is what determines the dynamics. Okay, so dynamics is as we have seen in the previous slide, with delta i j is now as the solutions of this optimization problem. Uh, notice that we have an optimization problem for each node i. So if we have n nodes, then we have n optimization problems to solve, and that gives the overall dynamics. Uh, the third dynamics is this network restricted way of maximization. This is uh, a centralized dynamics where uh, there is coordination among agents across all nodes, and there is one optimization problem where the overall social utility is maximized. Uh, with the network restricting the mo movements that are uh, the possible movements of uh, the agents. 
Okay, so that is what this is. Okay, so again, the uh, the optimizer of this uh, problem is what gives us this delta ij of x. So uh, just one point here. So this p2i uh, this is a nice optimization problem. Okay, so this has, uh, by the way, both these optimization problems are always feasible, uh, but this p2i, it, it always has a unique optimizer. Okay, so there is no question of uh, this dynamics being well-defined or not, right? It, it's well-defined. Uh, but for this NRPM, uh, we don't have unique optimizers. But the thing is, uh, even, uh, even if we have multiple optimizers, this J times delta X is always unique. Okay, so uh, the dynamics is still unique, even in the case of NRPM. So uh, with this, uh, I just want to talk about the first main result. And, so just a one minute heads up, if you could wrap up in a minute, that'd be great. Okay, but I also started a bit late. Yeah, I'm trying to go yeah. Okay, fine. I'll try to finish as soon as possible. Okay, so uh, so then uh, for these three dynamics, uh, what we show is uh, we have existence and uniqueness of solutions. And then, um, okay, so it is a bit challenging, especially in the case of NPRD and NRPM because the dynamics is really coming out of uh, optimization problems. And then uh, we have uh, asymptotic convergence to a set of Nash equilibria and uh, the social utility also converges. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I won't really go into uh, some of these details. So one thing I want to uh, talk about is that uh, uh, even though we have greater coordination, uh, the fact is that uh, they're still myopic, these dynamics. So myopic coordination can still be worse than myopic selfishness. Okay, so uh, again, I won't go into details, but there's an interesting example uh, that demonstrates that. Okay, so, um, okay, since I don't have much time, so uh, I'll just say that, uh, okay, let me just go back to this result uh, because uh, we have the social utility converging and then uh, the state also converging to the set of Nash equilibria. We would like to say something about what the steady state social utility is. Okay, so uh, in general, we can't say uh, what that is, but uh, we may want to give some bounds on that uh, steady state social utility. Okay, first is, um, okay, I won't go into this, but uh, but basically we define some notion called quasi-concave hill. And um, okay, so it's a, it's a very interesting definition, but okay, so if the graph is a QCH, then in fact, uh, we can guarantee that uh, uh, we have a unique Nash, Nash equilibrium and all three dynamics converge to the same state. Okay, and uh, uh, for a general graph, uh, we give upper and lower bounds. Uh, we have uh, elaborate algorithms to do that. Uh, but essentially, for the upper bound, uh, we sort of uh, reduce the graph based on initial conditions and some estimates of max population fraction uh, that may be there in, in each node i over time. And then we solve the convex problem, convex optimization problem. For lower bound, it's uh, it's a lot more tricky. Uh, but again, so we do we partition the graph and then uh, uh, in an appropriate manner again we solve an optimization problem uh, to get a lower bound. Okay, so uh, we just did some simulations uh, on an 18 node graph. Uh, this is the graph. Uh, and um, so for example, here, we do see that uh, the upper and lower bounds returned by our algorithm are indeed uh, bounds, upper and lower bounds for the actual steady state social utility for these dynamics. So the value of our algorithm is really seen in these numbers here. So for example, if you simulate these dynamics, uh, then SSD takes two minutes, okay, not much. NBRD and NRPM, they do take a, a lot of time, nine hours and five hours, but then uh, the bounds, we can compute in just 3.48 seconds. Okay, so that's orders of magnitude improved. Uh, we also evaluated the performance of these bounds with uh, varying graph sparsity. Uh, okay, so long story short, uh, especially the uh, upper bound does really well as the edge probability increases, right? So as the graph uh, sparsity decreases in the graph, okay? So, uh, okay, I won't go into the details about the rest of that uh, slide. Okay, and okay, so the, I, I won't uh, summarize, I think that, okay, fine. And I just want to acknowledge, uh, basically this is a collaborative work with uh, one of my students, Nero Mandal. Uh, and we had some conference paper too, but then uh, these two papers, which are available in archive, have the details if you're interested, uh, you can check. Okay, so thank you for listening to me today. Thanks a lot for powering through in the last few minutes. Really appreciate uh, that. Uh, while we have Vaibhav setting up his slides, if anyone has questions for Pawan, please feel free to ask away. So Vaibhav, you can start sharing your screen. 
Thank you, it's visible. So any questions for Pawan? Okay, thank you. If, if not, you can always drop a note to him offline and uh, he, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer. So next up, we'll move on to Viber. Uh, so Viber is a faculty at uh, the EC depa department as well as the Bosch Center here at IIS. And uh, he works in the area of uh, control theory, optimizations, communication theory, and so on. And he's going to be talking to us about optimal load altering attacks and power system. Viva, all yours. You're not audible yet. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, thanks, uh, Yogesh. So since uh, I have very less time, probably 10, 12 minutes. So I'll, in this talk, I'll briefly explain one very specific mathematical problem that uh, we have been working on recently and how we can apply this approach uh, in analyzing uh, load altering attacks in power systems. And this is a joint work with uh, Fabio Pasqualetti at uh, UC Riverside. So let me move ahead. So I'll not go into the details. We all know that security is a very much crucial topic in cyber physical systems, since there are multiple types of attack possible due to the communication and computing capabilities present in these systems. So we need to identify vulnerable locations and vulnerable types of attacks in these systems. And uh, specifically in this talk, I'll focus on, on power grid, the first uh, figure on top left. Okay, so let me go straight into the problem. So normally what happens is that in a, in a power grid, there is a frequency regulation mechanism. And this is typically uh, done uh, via controllable and frequency responsive loads. So what happens is that if in a grid, the, the frequency decreases, uh, then you decrease the load. And if the frequency of the grid increases, then you increase the load. So this is the typical regulation mechanism. Uh, to regulate the grid frequency. But what can happen is that the attacker, if, the, if an attacker gets hold of these uh, loads, then it can do the exact opposite. So basically if your uh, grid frequency decreases, then the attacker can increase the load and vice versa. So this can uh, induce a positive feedback in the loop. And as a result, the overall grid frequency can become uh, very large or very small. It can deviate from the nominal value and this is how the attack can happen. So basically uh, we need to uh, uh, study how resilient is our system or how resilient is the power grid with respect to these type of attacks. So that is what we study in this problem. So let me straight into go into the power system model that we use. So in the model we have some generators and some loads and we assume that the transmission lines are lossless and there is no objective power. So this is a typical equation, uh, uh, simplified equation for a generator in a, in a power grid. And here we have the usual suspects. Uh, the MI is the moment of inertia, DI is the damping coefficients. Omega is the frequency deviation from the nominal value. And this omega, I, we want it to be as close to zero as possible. This first term here, PMI denotes the mechanical power input to the generator. And uh, this last term denotes the power generated by the generator. So this is the, the generator model. Uh, next, uh, next, I will model this first term here, the mechanical power input model. So this mechanical power input model is again a combination of two terms. The first term is a proportional term and the second term is an integral term. And this model arises when uh, the, the mechanical input is a combination of a turbine governor controller and a load frequency controller. Again, if you're not familiar with power systems, uh, you can just treat it as a kind of a PI controller. Okay, and then we have a standard power flow equations in the, in the power grid here, uh, theta, these theta values are the phase angle deviations and uh, these L, Lij denote the transmission line admittance. So these are standard models in power grid. So if you don't understand this completely, that is completely fine. I'll simplify this uh, later on. Uh, this is uh, somewhat important, the load model, right? So we are trying to control the loads. So you can imagine like in our smart homes, we have different types of loads. And nowadays we have a increasing capability of choosing those loads in real time. So a typical load has two components. The first part here is a frequency sensitive load. So as your frequency changes, this component will change automatically. So you cannot really control this. Uh, the second part is typically the uh, frequency insensitive part and you can really control this part. 
And this is the part that the attacker gains hold into and uh, it can try to vary these loads in such a way to destabilize the, the whole system. Okay, so now finally, the last equation for the attack model. So how does the attacker attack the system? So here we use a proportional kind of a controller. So here the, the, the loads are varied in proportional to the uh, grid frequencies. So this is what this equation says. So it's a proportional type of controller and the, the proportionality constant here, Kij, this, these are the constants that the attacker wants to determine in order to destabilize the network. So simply put, the attacker's goal is to pick these constants, Kij's, such that it can destabilize the whole system. That is the goal of the attacker in, in, in this scenario. Okay, so if you combine all those equations that I mentioned before, you get this simplified model. And this simplified model is typically known as singular linear system. So it, here this matrix E is a singular matrix. So that's why the term uh, singular linear system if this matrix E is identity, then it uh, boils down to the standard uh, linear system. Okay, so this is the model of the whole overall power system and the overall attack combined together. And again, this is this is a simplified model uh, to to uh, perform the analysis. Okay, so now we'll work with the simplified model. And remember, the attacker's goal is to find this delta, uh, this perturbation delta, that can destabilize the system. So basically it wants to shift the eigenvalues of the system to the right half plane. That is the goal of the attacker. And within this goal, it needs to take care of two things. The first thing is that the attacker has access to only a subset of loads and frequency measurements, right? So for example, in this matrix, you can see that the second row is zero. This means that the attacker does not have access to the second load in the system. Similarly, the third column is zero. This means that, that the attacker does not have access to the third frequency in the system. So this sparsity uh, structure of this matrix determines what the knowledge uh, that is available to the attacker and what uh, loads are accessible by the attacker. So typically this sparsity structure can be anything. Uh, so the, the framework is valid for any sparsity structure. And the second uh, goal of the attacker is to choose the least amount of load that it that can be compromised uh, to destabilize the system. Because it does not want, uh, so suppose the attacker needs to access a large amount of loads in the system, then uh, its purpose is defeated. So it, it wishes to minimize the, the amount of load that can compromise to destabilize the system. And this results in minimizing uh, this norm of this uh, matrix delta here. Okay. So these are the two considerations. And uh, next, uh, let me try to visualize the problem before presenting the solutions. Right. So for that, uh, let us denote what is known as the spectral value sets. So this is nothing but all the eigenvalues of uh, this matrix, such that the norm of this perturbation is less than some value eta here. Okay. So let's start with neta equal to zero. Right? So if eta is zero, then this delta will also be zero. And therefore you have only these four eigenvalues in this, uh, in this case. But what happens is that as you start increasing this value of eta, these eigenvalue sets will start growing. Okay? And there will be a point. Uh, so these sets will grow as eta increases. So here eta is 0.3. And there will be a point where these sets will touch this imaginary axis. So this whole figure is a complex plane. And here you can see that these sets are finally touching the imaginary axis. And this is the precise point of stability radius. This is the point that we want to find. Because if, if delta is increased beyond this point, then your system will become unstable. So this is the, uh, the, the critical point that we, we want to find in this, in this problem. Okay, so to capture all this uh, goal of destabilization, we form this optimization problem. Again, we want to minimize the norm of this perturbation delta, uh, as I explained before. So this is the cost function, and there are two constraints in this problem. The first constraint is the eigenvalue uh, assignment constraint. So basically, we want the eigenvalues of the system to lie on the imaginary axis. And this is precisely because we want to capture these uh, points where these spectral value sets touch the imaginary axis. So therefore we want eigenvalues to be 
uh, lying exactly on the imag imaginary axis. And the second constraint is the sparsity constraint that I uh, mentioned previously. So this perturbation uh, needs to be of an exact sparsity structure and that is captured by uh, this constraint. I'll not go into the details, but you can use this Hadamard product to capture this. Okay. So basically when you solve this problem, you will get this, the stability radius of the system. And a small value of the stability radius implies more vulnerability, right? Because if the value is small, then the attacker can um, basically change only a few loads and it can result in instability. So ideally we would want uh, this uh, optimal value to be large for the system to be more resilient. Okay, so this is the original problem that I described. I'll not go into the details, but what we do is we transform this original problem into a more relaxed uh, and unconstrained problem. So here on the left, uh, basically we have the problem with some constraints, but on the right side, uh, we can show that we can convert this problem into an unconstrained problem uh, by using some uh, penalty based methods. And also we use uh, Sylvester equation based parameterization. Again, I'll not go into the details due to lag of time, but uh, the main point is that we convert this original problem into a more into a relaxed problem, which is much more feasible. And since this is an unconstrained problem, we can use standard gradient descent or Newton descent method to, to solve this uh, more relaxed problem. Okay, so just a couple of slides on the simulations and then I'll conclude. So here we have a, a IEEE 39 bus power network, which has 10 generators and 29 loads. And here in this case, uh, we consider the, the scenario where there's an attack on load number 11 based on measurements from generator number one. So since uh, there is attack on only one load and the measurement is available on from only one generator, a single only a single entry of this matrix delta can be non-zero, remaining all the entries will be, the, will be zero. And here you can see in these figures that uh, as you increase or uh, as you decrease this value of delta uh, one comma one, your system will be, uh, goes from, from being stable uh, to marginally stable, and then it becomes unstable in this last figure. So in the last figure, you can see that uh, the signal is, is, uh, is, is growing as time increases. So we have uh, encountered uh, instability. And in the second figure, we are just at, at a brink of uh, being unstable. Okay, so finally, uh, this is the final uh, simulation point. So. Uh, remember a lower value of this stability radius implies more vulnerability. So we basically plot this optimal value of uh, Delta star for all the uh, loads in this, uh, uh, in this uh, network. So this is the figure and this figure basically shows that for example, load number 20 is the most vulnerable load in the system. So all the resources that uh, we, we have to prevent these attacks should be targeted towards uh, these a lower spectrum of the loads. So basically using this framework, we can generate a vulnerability profile of the whole network that which points are more vulnerable and which points are less vulnerable. So this uh, basically gives an idea on how resilient is the whole network and which locations are more resilient than the other locations. Okay. So this is uh, the end of my talk. Uh, so just to summarize, we we formulated a, a optimal problem, optimal optimization problem for uh, dynamic and sparse load altering attacks. And we relaxed the problem and then we showed that we can use this framework to develop a vulnerability map of the, of the whole system. So that's it from my side, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot Viber for a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, we can take any quick questions if the audience uh, has any, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I'll ask Shishir, Shishir to set up his slides uh, for the next talk. Any questions for Vaibhav? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Vaibhav. So, and we'll move on to uh, Shishir. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, uh, Shishir uh, Kaltaya is an assistant professor at the RBC CPS uh, and as well as in the computer science uh, and automation department here at IASC. Uh, he has a PhD in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech and his uh, research interests are in the area of uh, 
uh, multi-leg robotics and uh, we are looking forward to hearing talk on learning plus control for leg locomotion uh, shishi all yours okay thank you yogesh you can see the slide right yes we can okay great great okay so i will try to uh, go really fast because we have to finish it fast so i'll be talking about learning come control for leg locomotion uh, to be more precise uh, uh i would like to explain a little, little more about learning and the control aspects specific for regard locomotion uh after what we have seen recently over the past couple of years so this is a very very recent result and uh, uh i will try to finish it as soon as possible okay uh so uh, let me introduce the team i have to give credit to the entire team of course so bharatwaj shalab ashitawa ashish aditya pramod and a lot of other research interns and research assistants who have been helping all throughout uh, so we have three robots uh, three walking robots uh, all are made in iisc developed in iisc and they have they are powered by servo motors and they have basic electronics cheap electronics and we have gone to several venues uh, with, with these robots uh, for example ipra 2019 iras 2021 coral 2020 and so on and so forth uh, and here are our latest results on walking uh stop light uh, it's very robust right now it's able to recover from uh, ear dust uh, this is uh, this stop light being put up to this wooden board and uh, we have stop 3 uh, early version of stop 3 stop 3 is a much bigger robot and a stronger robot uh, and uh, is so we just made finished making leg one leg for this robot and uh, yes i'm just simply showing uh, the simulation results of this one okay uh, coming back to the the main part of the talk uh, walking robot research has come a long way as a matter of fact it has matured significantly and there is a growing interest in legged robots even in india uh, so we have boston dynamics we have animal uh, we have a lot of other robots from italy usa and lots of other countries so on the left hand side we have uh, the mini cheetah and on the right hand side we have the animal from et zurich uh, like i mentioned uh, the field has gotten really mature so much so that now there are conflicting ideologies conflicting philosophies so there is one paper which shows amazing behaviors like back flips and then say that they have achieved this good model predictive control and on the right hand side we see amazing uh, recovery behaviors on the slippery ice and they say that it's because of reinforcement learning so for an outsider it's very difficult to decide so let's say that outsider has to has to build a robot now what which controller will be chosen so the question is who will win here mpc or reinforcement learning model predictive control or reinforcement learning and that's the whole part of this talk uh, so this is the quick outline so I, in order to understand what is better what is worse and so on and so forth we have to first understand the the, the fundamentals between the differences between control and learning and with this understanding uh, we will try to take the best from both the worlds in fact both are very important both have their use cases and we will try to understand this in, in a very fast way given the time constraints to be more specific i'll compare model predictive control and model free re of policy reinforcement learning algorithms okay so let me begin with the first part so to, to explain this better i'm going to bring the the control architecture that was used on that ice walking robot uh, we can see uh, mlps we, we can see tnc encoders we, we can see perception terrain estimation and a lot of these modules and i would like to focus your attention on the bottom most part the c control architecture and here we can see foot trajectory generator inverse kinematics joint pd controller robot dynamics so the more i look at it the more i realize this is not really 100% learning reinforcement learning right there is a significant part of this which is actually doing model based control right which includes the kinematics which includes the dynamics and this is like this is classical control right and this is what it is actually the devil is in the details so if you look at a nice walking look nice looking robot uh, we can we can see that it is working really well Uh, and there are several contributing factors to that right and this is what i would like to point your attention to this is exactly the case even for the other robot the mini cheetah robot so so in order to understand this better let me try to compare uh, 
the domain of control and the domain of learning. So feedback control, which is the foundation of control using feedback. And we have stochastic approximation, which is the foundation of reinforcement learning. And if we try to understand this more, uh, we have yt, and the goal is to drive yt to some desired value. Uh, and there are cert certain kinds of guarantees that we can actually talk about. For example, for linear systems, we can talk about exponential convergence, we can talk about controllability and so on and so forth. And this is more viewed like a loop. And we can talk about uh, stability and lots of other properties. Similarly, on the right-hand side, we have this function and we would like to drive it to some desired value, ideally minimize or maximize it. And again, here we can try to provide some guarantees. Uh, like if, if, for example, if there is some boundedness properties of the iterex theta t, uh, then we can think of talking about convergence, right? So the left-hand side is more viewed like a loop and the right-hand side is more viewed like an algorithm, right? So the difference is not huge. Similarly, if, you, if I talk about model predictive control and reinforcement learning, they're both doing the same, trying to minimize or maximize some cost criterion. And the, I, the goal is to choose the best sequence of states and control that minimizes this cost subject to some constraints. But the subtle difference is for, for something like model predictive control, uh, we use the structure of the cost and the model to get the best sequence of inputs. On the other hand, for reinforcement learning, we simply sample the cost and the state transitions. And then again, by observing these samples, we obtain the best sequence of inputs. So in one sentence, I can say that MPC emphasizes more on the model and less on the data and reinforcement learning emphasizes less on the model and more on the data, right? Now let's talk about the, 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 the domain of locomotion. So for, for a robot like animal, where they have used reinforcement learning to learn some very complex behaviors, the best way to use the model there is to somehow try to model some parts of the robot. And that's what they have done actually. And that's where the low level module comes in, right? Similarly for, for something like the mini cheetah where they have shown they have used model predictive control, they have used data, except that they have not explicitly mentioned it. They have done system ID for that. And that's how they're able to get better behaviors. So both have done both. Both, the, both, the, both of these robots have both of these techniques being incorporated. So with this understanding, let's try to combine the two. Uh, so let, let's try to combine control and learning, specifically MPC and model-free of policy RL, which I mentioned previously. So coming back to walking in, so we have the standard RL template. There are several benefits of using RL, like I said previously. The, the, the first advantage is if I have to make the robot learn by itself, I would go for a learning technique, right? So this requires, this does not require me to understand the complex dynamics and still achieve complex behaviors. But if you look at the existing RL techniques, and if you look at the number of iterations that are required, for example, for this half cheetah uh, to achieve 6,000 rewards, it takes three, and 3 million iterations for the first technique, which is called the DDPG. For the second one, which is called the TD3, it takes 500,000 iterations. Similarly for the set, right? Now, this is a lot of iterations from a practical standpoint. We cannot think of applying millions of iterations on a practical system, on a real hardware. So there is a real problem here. So this is when we can think of incorporating the model and then use this model information to improve the sampling efficiency. And that's what the focus here, here has been. And I have to give credit to Soumya and Utkarsh, my students who have been working full time on combining these uh, learning, and, learning and control techniques and come up with a nice way of formalizing it. So, so for, in order to explain it better, let me simply show the, the Bellman equation here. So I have this value function here, which is nothing but the minimum of the expectation of the cost plus the gamma times the value function for the next state. So here we have a single stage cost. Now I can expand this and convert this into an end stage cost, which is what the next equation is, right? So I have this end stage cost and the last cost is again the value function. Right? I have not really changed anything else. Now the end stage cost actually is an end step MPC formulation. So this is when we can think of using the model. So we can try to minimize this end stage cost 
using the model and at the same time learn the value function p through rl so now we have like a two loop approach which is very very effective oops sorry okay sorry uh, so let me introduce this one by one so there are two loops like i mentioned so one interacts with the model right so there is some kind of training in the for, for, for the inner loop so this is called the inner loop and then this can be connected with the real environment and now i have an outer loop so the inner loop interacts with the model the outer loop interacts with the environment right so now we can think of using techniques like mbpo mbpo is a classic example for an inner loop outer loop technique where they learn the model and then train on that and then similarly given this information we can similarly we can similarly train the outer loop so we have planning on the model which is the classic M M mpc and we have learning on the outer loop which is the classic reinforcement learning so in order to explain this even better so let me try to give you some timelines of what we are doing exactly so first we collect data from the environment and then we try to fit the model and the value function and then plan we collect even more data and this cycle repeats alternatively we can collect environment data fit the model and train the policy on this model itself apply policy on the environment and collect even more data right now when you think about this more and more you, you can think of several permutations and combinations so here is another example collect environment data fit the model do an mpc planner collect model data combine the two and then train your policy and the value function on both the model and the environment data and as a matter of fact uh starting from 2019 all the way till now quite a few papers have come out which actually talked about several variants of this and our approach which is actually the third part, third one uh, m demo rl uses dynamic mirror descent algorithms for solving the inner loop in, in mpc so i cannot get into the details the mathematical details of this due to the time constraints uh but here we simply use one of those uh, classic mirror descent techniques that was that is used for online learning that is used for mpc here and then now we have a classic model based model free approach which with this mpc formulations so this is our formulation so i have an auto loop which is again of policy rl so i can you think of using any of the self of the shelf rl algorithms and with this oops can you still see the screen yes the screen is uh, yes. seen so for some reason my screen is frozen ah oh, okay now it is back i don't know why okay you are able to see this right so now and then i have an mpc here so i use mirror descent on the mpc here to get a better algorithm so with this let me conclude uh, uh we have results which which are compared with the existing model based model free approaches and as you can see the pink curve is reaching the peak much faster which means that we are way more sampling sampling sample efficient so let me conclude by saying that i i proposed a generic framework for solving the mpc in the inner loop in other words i proposed a dmd mpc with the model free of policy rl uh, and then with this formulation uh, we can think of doing several variants uh and we not only have that we have flexibility of using uh, off the shelf rl algorithms along with the dmd mpc so with this i thank uh, everyone for listening great thanks a lot shishir that's really cool <laughs> demos and uh, it's, it's great to see the robots here on campus i should come and take a look at it on your lab sometime uh, so any questions for shishir we have maybe a minute uh, before we have to wrap up Shishir, I had a question. Yeah, can you comment on like how uh, coarse the model can be, like the uh, your initial uh, model that you assume for MPC, right? For instance, if I was to look at it at a wheel robot type of situation, can I start with like a kinematic model, though I know it's going to be slightly wrong, and the right thing to do is like a dynamic model? Okay, so th that's actually a very good question. I wanted to talk about it. uh so 
the goal should not be to find the most accurate model the goal should be to find the find a good model that best represents the task that you, that is interested that is interesting to you so in our case uh, we are using four legs so it's more like a flat robot and uh, what is a good model for that a point mass or maybe a potato model a rigid body model is sufficient for that so we have not used it here uh, but that is definitely in the plan we are planning to do that uh, for, for the next for the actual robot training uh, so currently we are using the neural network model just to show the efficiency of this method but we want to eventually use a rigid body model for this quadruped train on that and then again train on the actual robot right and at the same time estimate a better rigid body model based on the data that you get from the experiments so that is our next goal so it depends on the task to to say it in one line okay got it great thanks a lot shishir so uh, with that we'll wrap up this session uh, because uh, we have a really exciting uh, session coming up in about 10 minutes or so where uh, dr samia swaminathan chief scientist at who is going to be giving uh, a talk so i invite you all to join uh, us for that and uh, as a concluding event for the uh, symposium but uh, meaning, uh, now now is a chance for all of you to unmute and give a round of applause to all the speakers that we've had. Uh, it's been a really exciting talks, and it reflects some of the uh, really groundbreaking work that's going on at the Robert Bosch Center for uh, Cyber Physical Systems. And I invite you all to go visit the websites of the various faculty and reach out to them offline as well. Uh, thank you, all the speakers, all participants. We wrap up this session. Bye-bye. So Vaibhav, I transfer this to Subramani. Uh, actually, Vijay's, I see Vijay. Uh, so Vijay joined, I think, Vijay Chandru. So I transfer the host uh, to him? No, I think you can make Raghu as the host, right? Uh, oh, OK. Sure. Is that OK, Raghu? Yeah, that's fine. I will make him the co-host. There you go. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Vijay. Hi, hi. Morning. Okay, that's good. Uh, so I will make you the co-host if I can find you. <laughs> All right. And of course, uh, we'll have to do that for Samia as well when she comes in. Okay. So uh, I think now you should be... <laughs> Uh, you should have most of the controls. So when uh, she comes in, you can make her the co-host also. <clears throat> we'll look for her. Yeah, yeah. If you could also just yeah. look out. She may. So do you know if she has any slides? or? Um, no, there was no message on that. But she does usually have. Okay. At least a few. I think you might assume that she does. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure my bad son sounds up all right. So, uh, Raghu, I see Soumya, uh, the oh. list, participant list. Oh, now I think now she is gone. Okay. They may, have, they may have just tested, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, it's six thirty in the morning here, so I'm <laughs> sitting out in the deck. Okay. Take um, the We've got some nice trees over there. Looks like. Yeah. Yeah. But it's cold. <laughs> it's it's about fifteen degrees. So, Raghu, should I continue recording? It is still recording. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, I think you can. Yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Maybe just a couple of minutes anyway. So Um, so, Raghu, you'll uh, mute all uh, at, at some point. Uh, what is that? No, will you do the mute? Uh, oh, I think they can. Once I ma I'll make her the co-host, so she should be able to unmute and share um, her screen. Right, right. So, okay. We'll mute all and then... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So generally the questions are in the end, right? I would assume. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they can type them if they want to. Right. So you can just say that in the beginning. <laughs> right. Ah, Samia's here. Good afternoon, sir. I am uh, Andrea, her assistant. She'll be with you in two minutes. She's just finishing another call. Perfect, great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I have just made her the co host. That's fine. Yeah. Good afternoon, Vijay. Good afternoon, Samya. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for joining. Um, um, I think uh, I I will mute all. And uh, Raghu, are you going to make some initial comments? I'll. Uh, I think uh, you can introduce her. Can I'll just get started. Okay. So I'm going to mute all and then uh, Samya, please unmute yourself. Okay. Did that work? I'm unmuted. Uh, and 
You need to unmute yourself, I think, Samia. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, so let's get started. Um, I think uh, right on time. Um, so, Namaskara. Um, I think on behalf of uh, Art Park, which is the DST Government of Karnataka funded innovation hub for AI and robotics at IISC, the Bosch uh, Center for Cyber-Physical Systems, and the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Samya Swaminathan and welcome her to this specially arranged public lecture as we conclude the two-day symposium on cyber-physical systems. Um, thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for taking the time to be with us. Um, our former uh, Secretary for Health Research and Director General of ICMR, uh, Dr. Swaminathan, is now the first Chief Scientist of uh, WHO, the World Health Organization. Um, she has been deeply engaged with the idea that uh, digital health and AI can make a difference. Uh, back in uh, 2019, some of you will recall, um, there was the blueprint for digital health, uh, which WHO and the Ministry of Health had put out for comments. And we discussed this at, at IISC and this guided our digital health initiatives on campus. Uh, about uh, artificial intelligence for health, uh, Dr. Swaminathan has written that AI has enormous potential for strengthening the delivery of healthcare and medicine and helping all countries achieve universal health coverage. This includes improved diagnosis and clinical care, enhancing health research, drug discovery, drug development, and assisting with the deployment of different public health interventions, such as disease surveillance, outbreak response, and health systems management. Um, this paragraph is actually uh, borrowed from her uh, foreword uh, to the recent WHO guidance on the ethics and governance of AI for health, about which she will speak to us today. Um, we have requested uh, Dr. Swaminathan to speak for about 20 minutes about the guidance. And, um, and then we'll have a little time for questions. Um, so those of you who have questions, please uh, uh, type them into the comments box so we can track, track them. Um, with that, uh, it's over to you, Dr. Swaminathan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Vijay, and uh, greetings to all your colleagues uh, and friends who are uh, attending this conference. This is uh, obviously a new area and an interesting area. And the reason that um, I think Vijay also invited me to speak was because the WHO has very recently come out with um, a guidance document on the ethics and governance of artificial intelligence and health. And uh, Vijay was mentioning this, uh, the foreword to this document in which you know, we have also quoted Stephen Hawking, who said that our future is a race between the growing power of technology and the wisdom with which we use it. This uh, quote from the famous physicist reminds us also of both the opportunities and challenges that new technologies bring uh, to the health sector, but also beyond the health sector. I think all sectors today are impacted. Uh, by artificial intelligence to a greater or lesser degree. Um, the WHO created a science division in 2019 and it was essentially done to harness the power of science and technology and innovation and to make sure that, that uh, WHO remains at the cutting edge of science, but also that we leverage all of these new technologies, which include AI, but also things like you know, gene editing and, uh, and gene drive technologies, epigenetics, you know, the power of big data, machine learning, and all of that in order to, um, uh, all of which actually pose, you know, they have transformational opportunities, 
but also could pose risks to people. And I think that's what I want to focus on today. I have a presentation that I'm now going to share with you. And then we can um, obviously have some discussion at the, at the end. I hope you can see my, my presentation. Yes, and it's coming up. Yeah, okay, there it is. Go, yeah. We'll go into slideshow. No, yeah. Okay. So why did we pick uh, on this topic? Uh, because I don't need to tell this group, I guess, that AI is a very fast growing sector, uh, trillions of dollars, and that it has numerous health care applications, that it offers opportunities to strengthen health care, health research, drug discovery and development, improve diagnosis, timely public health surveillance, and particularly in areas of the world where there is a shortage of uh, healthcare uh, personnel and specialists, AI could fill some of those gaps. But it also poses significant ethical challenges and could undermine human rights protections. And we've seen during the COVID pandemic that there were many applications that were used by countries, particularly those around contact tracing that um, were operated in different ways in different countries, some of them with more and some with less uh, regulations around privacy and confidentiality. So WHO, of course, is uniquely placed to uh, both identify how AI can maximize countries' efforts to achieve universal health coverage while ensuring human rights and ethics are at the center of the design and deployment of AI for health. So we set up an expert group. This was uh, about 18 months ago, actually. Uh, yeah, it was just before the pandemic, actually, in October of 2019. Um, and the group, the remit of this group was to identify the ethical challenges and develop guiding principles, also to develop an ethical framework, uh, which could form the basis of a governance system of artificial intelligence for health. And, and to make some recommendations both to WHO as well as to other intergovernmental agencies, also to ministries in, in countries, not just ministries of health, but in this case, I think ministries beyond health are also concerned. Also to companies, programmers, you know, the big tech giants, health providers and civil society. So we had 20 international experts. Uh, the groups are, are always balanced across gender and across geographic region. And it was co-chaired by Partha Mazumdar from India and Effie Vayana from Switzerland. And this is the composition of the, um, of the expert group. We had one more Indian on this group. I think, yes, it was Roli Mathur from, uh, from Bangalore, in fact, from the ICMR. She's in charge of the ethics guidelines of ICMR. So there was one in-person meeting and then they had to switch to virtual meetings. And this, of course, the virtual format enabled us to invite a number of different um, external speakers and stakeholders to share perspectives and exchange ideas. And um, this group actually also did look at this proximity tracking applications that I was talking about. And, and the WHO in fact throughout the COVID pandemic has been putting out um, guidance around the ethics of uh, different issues that have come up, you know? So one of them is this, uh, the proximity tracking applications uh, and the ethics of using such uh, programs and apps, but also we've done on human challenge studies we've uh, done on mandatory vaccination and on these vaccine uh, passports um, and many other such issues. So this report that I'm talking about was launched on just a few weeks ago on the 28th of June. And essentially, uh, you know, I've shared the link here and I'm happy to share the slides. It's a, it gives you the definition of AI and applications for health. There are consensus principles. It outlines the ethical challenges and risks and then it talks about the governance and then it has checklists, which are more practical for implementation. These checklists are for three groups of people. One is for ministries, you know, to develop laws and regulations and rules and frameworks to govern. The second are for developers, the technology people. And the third set of checklists are for the hospitals, healthcare providers, uh, and those who are going to use these applications. So the ethical challenges identified by the group are uh, listed here, starting with when should AI be used? You know, we need to know actually what is the use case and why are we doing this? We have to keep in mind the digital divide. So we should not be in a situation where in a country like India, 
we are further excluding those who are already excluded from access to healthcare just because the same people who are you know the most marginalized also are the least likely to have access to smartphones and and, and to uh, the internet access we have to pay a lot of attention to how the data is collected and used there has to be some accountability and responsibility for the use of ai uh, autonomous decision making you know when when it's autonomous then ultimately who takes the responsibility for that bias and discrimination i think everybody is very familiar with the fact that uh, the ai algorithms are only as good as the data and if the data is not representative of the population then you're not going to have a good application uh, risks of ai to safety and cyber security the impacts of ai on um, on labor and employment in healthcare and medicine so are we actually replacing human beings and my own belief is that you cannot replace human beings in uh, the healthcare setting it can only be used as a tool to further support and strengthen what human beings are doing and uh, to to make them more effective the challenges in commercialization of artificial intelligence for healthcare and then finally artificial intelligence and climate change so these were some of the challenges that that were uh, identified the principles that the committee identified was first of all to protect autonomy you know this is one of the fundamental ethical principles <clears throat> of around justice human rights promoting human well-being human safety and the public interest has to be paramount there has to be transparency explainability and intelligibility there needs to be we need to foster responsibility accountability ensure inclusiveness and equity and promoting ai that is responsive and sustainable then they went into the governance itself and uh, discuss the legal regulatory and non legal measures for the ethical use of ai for health and they identified areas of governance that could both resolve the identified challenges we just talked about the ethical challenges and integrate the six consensus principles so they've got a number of recommendations in this report in fact there are 47 recommendations for these three groups of stakeholders that i talked about and just to give you an example one for designers uh, would be that you have to design ai systems to perform well defined tasks with accuracy and reliability necessary to improve the capacity of health systems and advance patient interests so we don't want to use an ai based tool which is not enhancing the efficiency or the efficacy and safety of of something whether it's a it could be a automated x-ray reading algorithm it could be uh, reading pathology slides it could be doing other kinds of uh, um, support with diagnostics you know for for patients but this is something that designers need to keep in mind and it needs to be tested then they say what governments should do and that's around of course having the laws the policies the frameworks to govern this uh, and to have a system whereby you provide uh, the country the government should provide the guidance to developers but also very importantly we need the regulatory systems so particularly when we are talking about medical devices and this is an area of work that i think who would also like to pursue is to, is to have this conversation with the medical device regulators to say how you would approach a new device that was based on ai how would that actually be tested validated and then approved for use in a particular population and in fact this is coming because we are involved in the development of a there are several tools in fact for the detection of cervical cancer uh, using uh, ai to actually do the reading of the um, pictures that the camera is taking you know of the uh, cervix uh, of the woman and and clearly the algorithm has to be trained and if you're going to have differences in this performance between countries then this is something that the regulators absolutely need to be aware of further there needs to be impact assessments of these technologies so it's not enough to just give the one time clearance but what governments what institutions should be looking at is is a constant sort of a evaluation uh, once it is implemented and see whether the outcomes that we want are actually 
getting achieved or not. Then for companies, they've talked about, of course, adhering to national and international laws and regulations. Now, we don't really have, as far as I know, international regulations that all companies can adhere to on the development, commercialization, and use of uh, AI. But this is clearly necessary. And uh, again, this is an area of work for WHO with UNESCO and other partners who are interested in this, in this area. Of course, UNESCO has a much broader remit. WHO is interested ma mainly in the health applications. And, and then of course, our member states are very interested in this. And, and what's happening now is that clearly the, the you know, high income countries have thought about this and have brought in rules and, and laws around data protection and how they're going to regulate these things. But the low and middle income countries really have not had the time to sit and think about this or to put in place systems. So we would like to really work with the lower middle income countries to ensure that the development and particularly the diffusion of AI technologies is in accordance with the ethical norms, human rights, protections, and legal obligations. And in fact, I was just discussing with my colleague earlier today about whether we should actually be developing a model legislation for countries instead of asking every country to, to develop something we could maybe help support that. And so when you look at our document, uh, obviously I've given a very uh, high level overview, but there's a lot of detail, a lot of context, and a lot of uh, um, additional information in this document. And it has these checklists, which are the practical steps to assist with implementation. And as I said, there are checklists for designers and programmers for ministries of health and for hospital systems and healthcare professionals and providers. And, and obviously these are principles and then they need to be uh, used and adopted uh, while they're implementing. So uh, again, it's a learning process. It's probably something like a living guideline which will need to be updated as we gather more information, more experience. What we would be like to focus on is to use this also. We have a global strategy on digital health. So uh, the WHO had developed this over the last two years and it was approved uh, in the World Health Assembly last year. And there is a plan, a 10 year plan for how countries must digitalize their health systems and move ahead. And I think we've learned a lot in the pandemic also about the, the need for good data systems, surveillance, integrated you know, data platforms, and also ways and means to share data, not only nationally, but globally for global collaboration. So this guidance guideline can hopefully help us and help countries as we roll out this uh, digital health um, strategy, there needs to be some kind of plans of action developed at the country and regional level. So we will work with through our regional offices to provide country support to ministries of health, to ethics committees and others who might, um, who might ask for that support. We want to continue with having a community of practice. So now this expert group has developed this guideline, shouldn't be the end of it. So we need to keep this uh, dialogue and discussion going we also work with the International Tele Telecommunications Union because they have obviously a lot of, uh, they work with uh, phone companies and other tech companies. But now WHO has also started working directly with, with many tech companies, particularly during the pandemic um, and engaging with other organizations, as I said, like OECD, UNESCO and others. And then we will need to disseminate these guidelines. So we are planning a number of workshops in the coming months. So I think I will end, uh, I will stop there. Uh, but again, with a reminder that we need to ensure that the digital health revolution, which is taking place now is inclusive, sustainable and safe and does not leave anyone behind. Thank you, Vijay, back to you. Um, thank you, Samia. Um, you know, for a very quick, but very thorough overview of the, of the document. Um, I would encourage all developers, uh, many of whom are, are on this call, to, to go take a look and particularly read the checklist, the appendix uh, uh, for developers. I think uh, it has uh, some useful gems there. I um, would like to just start off with a question that I have, and then there's one in the chat uh, window, so I'll, I will get to that. Um, my first uh, question is that, um, you know, uh, at Art Park, uh, we've been fairly proactive uh, in thinking about issues of ethics uh, and AI um, 
for health particularly and um, and we've uh, you know had had some discussions um, around um, you know the the idea that perhaps the traditional irbs uh, or ethics committees uh, institutional ethics committees that uh, you would go to actually um, you know there's a, there's a little bit of uh, 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 difficulty in uh, in uh, explaining uh, you know the ai applications to them uh, there's a little unfamiliarity with what ai does and uh, you know and uh, quite often, uh, you know, the very extreme uh, views on um, on AI uh, do come up. They, is there a guidance uh, for setting up the right kind of IRBs uh, for reviewing AI for health proposals? We've, um, you know, would it actually make sense to set set up our own? Uh, uh, IRB or uh, has uh, has WHO given this issue any thought, right? Or the expert yeah. committee, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a really great question, uh, Vijay. Obviously, I think people have only started now thinking about this uh, issue. And as I said, one of the things we want to do is to raise awareness um, around this report and all the questions that it raises with you know, ethics committees in countries with national regulatory authorities, et cetera, and really start engaging with them in a dialogue. So I think it's a very good point. And I will um, talk to my colleagues about what we can do with, through our network of ethics committees, perhaps come up with, uh, with some guidance because traditionally ethics committees may not involve people with this expertise in this, in this field, you know? Right. So right. now that, uh, Health ethics committees will start need to start looking at this topic. They need to include people with uh, with this. They could be included on an ad hoc basis, or they should they could. Uh, I don't think you should have a separate ethics committee, but should be expanded with uh, the necessary expertise. So I think that's a very good uh, suggestion for uh, both follow up at WHO, but also at the national level. And I can also pass this on to Roli Mathur, who can. Take it up with the ICMR in India. Yeah. So we have uh, now some questions piling up in the chat window. So I'll I'll uh, quickly uh, run through some of them. Um, uh, one is of course on the global issue of uh, you know AI being in the hands of private corporations and, and how does ensure how does one ensure that AI is used in the public interest. Um, and um, a particular note there that, uh, and this is from Devdat uh, Dubashi at um, Chamas in Sweden, um, DeepMind has made its database of protein structures public and also open sourced its code. And, uh, you know, AlphaFold, which came out of uh, DeepMind is actually one of the landmark developments uh, in, uh, in computational AI. Um, and, um, could uh, this model be made uh, kind of um, an exemplar for companies using AI in, in health? Right? And, uh, so, so it's sort of a regulatory uh, question, and uh, you know, perhaps importantly, a global one. So maybe WHO is the right agency to to think about that. I think it's a very good. Um, uh, step that DeepMind has has taken. There are more and more such initiatives. And I don't know if it can be made mandatory, but certainly, right. you know, we're talking a lot about, uh, the WHO has been talking a lot about the new models for R&D because, you know, we've been talking, uh, everyone's discussing the TRIPS waiver, which is being discussed at the WTO for specifically for COVID vaccines and, and products. But it's a, it's a bit much broader issue, really, I think that Public investment in R and D, government investment in R and D, then should lead to uh, to information or products that are available to the public as a public good. So, yes, I, I think it's a model that that should be certainly encouraged. Uh, whether it can be made mandatory, I don't know. But this is an area of work, as I mentioned. WHO would like to take further because we know that tech companies, especially the big ones, 
have a lot of power and control over right. data and and they definitely need to play ball if uh, if any of this is going to be successful i i think there's also uh, a, a question yeah. about uh, autonomy i see in the in the in the chat yes yeah you see that oh, good yeah and uh, the elaboration uh, you know uh, of uh, complex uh, decision making scenarios uh, and autonomy yeah. um yeah please go ahead yeah you know i yeah i think the uh, yeah all of these questions are complex i don't have any good answers as such to any of them mm -hmm. for example even the issue of uh, can you collect data can hospitals you know which happens now uh, basically hand over the data to a company that then aggregates data and then maybe perhaps sells it to other uh, companies or, or even academic researchers etc and there is a whole concept of data altruism where people are willingly you know would give up their health data for uh, applications but again we cannot presume that uh, something can be done on the basis of delta uh, of um, altruism data altruism i this discussion needs to happen i think with public and civil society i know right. a few countries where there's so much of trust in the system in the government that uh, estonia is, a, is an example where the citizens are willing to let the it's, it's a completely digital country and the government has uh, all the data from citizens and then they use it actually for citizens benefit and there is a trust relationship there uh, but in most other countries that's not the case and so i think it's a area for for debate as to yes it would be really good to have a large amount of health data in 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 a, a accessible to people who can then use it to develop um, programs or or use it to to do analyses to further improve health outcomes but um, you have extreme positions on the one hand you have you know extreme data protection confidentiality where nothing can be touched and on the other hand you have no regulation where anyone can pick up data and the private sector basically operating unregulated so we need to find a balance between the two and i think this has to come from debates you know within civil society and there needs to be a balanced approach that countries must take to this so i think yeah yeah i i just want to add a little um, uh, follow up to that uh, discuss uh, i mean uh, the issue of autonomy and uh, also uh, you know india has been kind of uh, in the front in some ways um, in thinking through this whole business of data protection and non personal data versus personal data and you know making that distinction and chris kopal krishnan and the committee the uh, proposal on non personal data um mm -hmm. and uh, and also the how the benefits uh from uh this data can flow back to communities and and the sources of data which uh, which i think is a is a pretty radical uh, uh idea uh and um, you know might be you know a, a model that uh, uh could be developed further for particularly the lower income countries that uh, who may be may be advising so just just a comment there i i'm not so sure that uh, things are well developed enough uh, right now but but i think uh, yeah. uh, there's something interesting there um i think uh, uh, let me let's take one, uh, one more minute of your time if you don't mind and um, i uh, there's a question about citizen participation and capacity building and so on but let me let me pose it in a slightly different way and uh, you know one of the challenges is that when there's a use of ai for health um, put out on social media um you know various sort of advisories that come up on social media um and um you know the uh, obviously the there's a big issue of the credibility of uh, some of these uh, advisories that come out and in fact the national academy of medicine has very recently put out the discussion paper 
which I've been reading, and uh, it's called Identifying Credible Sources of Health Information in Social Media. And uh, the idea of calling out misinformation uh, is, is quite complex. I mean, there's, there's various uh, protocols, the CPGs, the CRAP test, the SIFT test, URAC, et cetera. So, uh, but this looks like an ideal application for an AI system. And if one were to able to, you know, if say WHO commissioned a kind of, uh, you know, universal, uh, you know, uh, sort of credibility checker, right? Which, uh, which could be, um, you know, could be revised from time to time, of course. And, um, but that, that might actually be one, you know, uh, one way in which uh, kind of standard on, um, on, this can, because some of it is very dangerous, which is, you know, we all know that, you know, you'll get some really crazy advice on social media and, you know, that could really harm people. So, so uh, any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have been faced with that, of course, quite a bit. Right. Um, it was always there, but it really, I think, reached epic proportions during the pandemic, pandemic just because right. of the number of people who are out there on social media and the you yep. know so the term infodemic was I mean, coined right. and uh, in fact there was a big infodemic conference that was organized here and it was about mm -hmm. communicating science but but also about this question of credible information versus not there isn't an easy way we have been engaged so what we do is we scan social media and uh, report to YouTube or Facebook or whichever Twitter, whichever uh, platform it is, anything that we see as misinformation, we flag it. And all of these tech companies have committed to removing misinformation. So they have their own systems in place for screening. Right. Right. Yeah. And I'm not sure what algorithms they use, but we also get back to them and then they remove that immediately when it's flagged by WHO as not being credible or being misinformation. But I think what you're suggesting is that we develop some kind of, yeah, a diagnostic for misinformation a metric. Which, exactly, uh, yeah. So a kind of an expert, expert committee approach to, to building such yeah. a system. Uh, of course, you know, we could involve DeepMind and groups like that, which could be very helpful. Uh, but, but it could, yeah. I and think, I think to have more actually, citizen participation. Right. More citizen participation, yes. Right. right. And yes, I think that's worth, uh, worth thinking about. Of course, it would uh, go across a range of technical topics. So, you know, pandemic is okay. It's just one topic. But otherwise, right. you, vaccine hesitancy is a big one now that, that we're having to deal with. But a lot of anti-science uh, information out there, really confusing people. So... I think it's, um, yeah, it is something for the future. We have to right. be, as I say always, this is the first pandemic in a, in a social media era. And so we, we are having to deal with these new challenges, which we did not in the past of uh, this Thanks. misinformation just spreading around the world so quickly. And uh, out, in fact, it always spreads faster than, you know, credible information. So it's, it's, it is a very big challenge. And uh, we, right. we, we identified it as one of the top global health challenges actually way back before the pandemic in 2019. So yeah, good area to work on. <laughs> so, work on. Yeah. Right. so well, the questions are flowing fast and furious now in the chat box, but uh, you know, I am cognizant of your time. So I, I think uh, if with your permission, Samia will we'll capture those questions and maybe send you a mail and perhaps someone from your office could, could respond. Uh, yeah. That would be uh, very helpful. I think um, uh, with that, maybe, you know, uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time. And I think, um, you know, I think more, more people need to get to know about this, uh, uh, you know, comprehensive document that uh, your team has put out and, and uh, and I'm sure, um, you know, uh, this will become kind of a, a landmark um, guidance that, uh, that, you know, the AI developer community is who we really deal with uh, largely. And, uh, and hopefully the, there's a, you know, uh, there is some, uh, 
uh, awareness on the ethics and the governance issues that comes in mm. uh, into into most of these groups now uh, with this. So thank you very much and uh, and uh, for taking the time and uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining in, and I think uh, it uh, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up later. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Okay, yeah, thank you, Vijay. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. So, Raghu, Bharadwaj, word of thanks? Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, go ahead, Raghu. Uh, why didn't you start and then I'll. Actually, I think Shishir was supposed to do that. So. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so we are at the end of the Cyprus Symposium 2021. So it has been a great symposium. So let me start uh, thanking one by one. So the first thanks should obviously go to Raghu, who spearheaded the entire symposium, including the tutorials and uh, today's session. Uh, so thanks a lot, Raghu, for your leadership and your great efforts in making this happen. I understand. Very welcome. Yeah, <laughs> I understand the pain in uh, sending repeated emails to all the speakers and uh, having to deal with no response for a long time. Yeah, it's it's obviously difficult, but uh, finally I think we pulled it off really greatly. So thanks a lot, Raghu, again. Uh, so along with Raghu, let me also thank uh, Vaibo, uh, Ruth uh, from IAC, uh, Amit uh, and Ravi from Art Park. So the, the, all four of you, thanks a lot. You supported Raghu really well. Uh, so managed a lot of things, uh, helped with a lot of email interactions and so on and so forth. So thanks again to all of you. So you like clap hands every time. Yeah. So I request everyone to clap hands every time I say thank you. Okay. Uh, special thanks to PhD forum panelists, uh, Pawan, Mukunda, and Aditya for uh, being on uh, being on time and making sure that you have given your marks. And uh, have the awards been, been announced, Bharadwaj, or uh, is it going to be separate? No, no, actually, you should be doing that now. Oh, I should be? Okay. So maybe, Bharadwaj, maybe you would like to. Yeah. Uh, just announce know. the winners, and then I will thank the, the remaining organizers. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we had this PhD forum, and uh, I think uh, uh, I think it was a very interesting, uh, very interesting set of uh, talks, and we had a, a, a review panel which uh, selected uh, the top two uh, presentations, and uh, the winners are uh, Meenakshi Sarkar uh, from Department of Aerospace Engineering. Uh, her topic was hey. uh, deep, deep visual prediction with decomposing camera and optic motion. And the second winner uh, is uh, Sindhu Padakanla from uh, Computer Science and Automation. Uh, and uh, her topic uh, was uh, algorithms for challenges to real world reinforcement learning. So, a uh, hearty congratulations to both of them. I think. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and then uh, Art Park is very glad to announce a price of uh, 50,000 rupees to each of you. And uh, our Art Park team will be in touch with you to, you know, do the logistics. Uh, you know, I wish we, we, we had it uh, live where we could probably give you like in the IPL, you know, <laughs> check. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll do it. So over to you, Shishir. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. And congratulations again to the winners. And... Uh, definitely a big thank you to the other participants in the PhD fora. Uh, your participation was very, very important. So all of us listened to your talks. It was really good. Uh, hopefully next year you can try again and maybe you can win it. Uh, okay, so let me thank also thank uh, Shishan Chars, uh, Jishnu, Amit for chairing the tutorials yesterday. And uh, Bharadwaj, you again, Chiru, Shalab, and Yogesh for chairing the remaining sessions in the main symposium, which was today. Uh, special thanks to Vijay Chandru 
for uh, chairing the public lecture which uh, which concluded just now uh, even though it was late i think it was uh, great that we had it uh, and uh, thank you all the speakers uh, who actively participated in the symposium and made it a huge success uh, website and publicity so thank you subramani shri devi lavanya uh, adil manjunath ipsita from iac and art park uh, website was updated continuously so it was updated at lightning speed so which was great so thank you subramani and also the publicity was handled really well by the remaining uh, team so it was it was great and last but last the least uh, thank you to the chairs general chairs bharadwaj and umakant uh, thanks to you we were able to pull in uh, all the big speakers and uh, made it a huge success so thank you everyone and and finally thank you to thank you to all the audience for staying so late so with that let me clap once and for all yeah and, and thank you shishir for all your efforts too you missed thanking yourself thanks a lot yeah okay so before we conclude anyone has a has any final thoughts to say and uh, uh, i think uh, uh, you know it's been uh, four years now for the symposium and uh, it actually this is the fifth one by the way fifth one yeah uh, so this is the fifth edition and uh, we have been having excellent set of speakers uh, you know really top world class speakers in all these editions and uh, it's been a invitation uh, only kind of symposium but perhaps uh, it is time now to think of uh, 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 you know also having uh, perhaps uh, uh, more contributions from uh, within the country maybe we can think of expanding the scope of the symposium yes peer review type contributions and so on now that we have also set up uh, 25 hubs under the icps mission and uh, we could also look to have this uh, symposium maybe move around the country in different parts of the country uh, kind of like ncc for example the national conference of communications that could be a model uh, or it could be in bangalore i don't know it depends Uh, yeah yeah i think that's a good idea uh, by the way we had 920 registrations for this conference we'll have uh, more uh, more of such uh, i think this online really is very helpful so in that sense uh, more people can participate um, yeah so thanks again to uh, everyone uh, uh, to all the organizers and all the participants so we'll we'll see you again next year all right yeah thank you all see you again next year and have a nice weekend